Okay, then uh, I will turn the, my mic to uh, 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 Zahla. Uh, let me invite Zahla Ali at the first. Thank you. Event. Okay, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Keiko. I really like your comparison with the Paris Commune. It's also, <laughs> it's also one of the avenue of research that I'm also kind of thinking of at the moment. Thank you very yeah. much. And thank you for organizing this. Thank you very much for making this possible. Um, it is so rare that we have bilingual panel that we uh, also have people coming from uh, talking from different continents, actually. Uh, and, and, and I'm so, so glad, uh, you know, that uh, actually we managed to put uh, together this panel. And thank you so much for Khalid, uh, to Khalid for the translation. Uh, thank you, Ali, Ala. thank you so much. Uh, uh, I think I'm, I'm happy that this is recorded so that we can share it, you know, widely, uh, uh, you know, after. Um, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna present in English also because I I wanted to, uh, to have a balance between the English and the Arabic and then I'll translate a summary in Arabic in in Arabic. So I'll uh, uh, I'm gonna start. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is instead of trying to provide really an ov overview of my fieldwork um, in Baghdad, in Najaf, in Karbala, in Nasriya. Uh, since 2015, because I really started researching a protest movement in 2015, when the first wave of major protests started. Uh, instead of doing that, because we don't have a lot of time, I'm really going to focus on a particular individual uh, that I met and uh, spent time with and interviewed in Tahrir Square in Baghdad uh, last December, December 2019. And really from this example, I will try to um, to show how I, I'm, I'm attempting to theorize and, and to make sense of the Iraqi uprising. So I'm going to start with, uh, I'm also looking at the time, so, um, so I'm going to start with um, something that really struck me, uh, a sentence that he, he, he said basically. He said, you have to walk in the path of life and in the path of death at the same time. I walked both paths and as survived. It's, some, it's a sentence that he said he, um, uh, when we were sitting in a tent in, Bah in, in Baghdad, Tahrir Square in December 2019, when he was telling me about his life trajectory, about the circumstances that led him to become a very well-known and a very respected figure of the uh, October uprising. Uh, Abbas uh, is from, uh, was born in a small and impoverished, uh, impoverished village in Walsit, which is in southeast, uh, uh, the southeastern part of Iraq. Uh, he spent his childhood there until he left on his own for Baghdad uh, at the age of 13 years old. He arrived as a, as a child alone in a burning capital in the middle of the sectarian war. Uh, he found a daily paid job carrying goods on his back and pushing a, widow, a wooden cart in the big Shorda market. And he said, I left for Baghdad because of the poverty of the place I'm from and the traditions and the customs that dominate everything. I wanted a radical change in my life, so I left for Baghdad. So for several years, uh, Abbas went, was one of the child workers navigating the city witnessing explosions and armed violence on a daily basis. And he describes uh, these years in Baghdad. I came all the way from where I'm from um, because I needed money to leave for me and my family to secure a better life for them, a life of dignity, of karama. And after five years of working daily jobs, he found employment in the tourist sector that led him to live in Turkey for a few years. So uh, the years he spent really there in Turkey changed him radically as he experienced a different place with functioning uh, state infrastructures, services, away from war, away from daily explosions and armed violence, a life that he feels and he insists very strongly that he's been deprived of. He says, there hasn't been a time when we could forget about the pa past traumas and move on to a better life. It's worse after worse after worse. No progress, no positive evolution from the former regime to this one. It's like all the regime repress and kill us no matter who they are. We just want to live a life in dignity. Living in Turkey was a life-changing experience. It changed my personality, my mentality, myself. 
I feel that I should have known this different life before, this new personality. I got it too late. I should have known about all that way before. I was deprived of that during the beginnings of my life." End of quote. So after coming to Baghdad in his early 20s, he, he uh, worked for a private company and he started uh, uh, to become involved in the initiatives organized by civil society activists. And he participated in the 2015 protest movement. So Abbas really insists on building a society based on this notion that is very central in the protest, El Medaniya. And he defines in Med in El Medaniya as synonymous of equality, freedom, as, being, as living a life that is away from war and militia violence. And Abbas dreams of a uh, dream of a country with strong infrastructures that provide essential services such as water, electricity, healthcare, affordable housing, good education, job opportunities, and a government that does not kill its own people. So he insists on his rejection of all the parties in power. For him, the whole political elite is self-serving. It is corrupt, sectarian, violent, and it does not care about the ordinary citizen. So when I met him, actually, Abbas has, has been living under the tents in Tahrir Square since almost three months. Uh, he lost his job and he left his salary for the sake of what he calls the revolution. And he talks about the ideal society he's building in Tahrir Square, where he finds all that he has been wishing for. So I'm starting quoting him again. He says, leaving my job is not a big challenge for me. I've seen corruption, I have experienced poverty, and I'm here for a bigger goal, not for a job and losing my job is worth the bigger goal that I'm fighting for. I'm here for a watan, a country. Uh, the revolution will give me a watan. Everything is provided for us here. People with money donate to us, even buses and of companies. People give us clothes in Tahrir Square, food, cigarettes, everything we need to live here in Tahrir. People are cooking all the time. You see many kitchen under the tents. We obtain things and a lifestyle in Tahrir that we didn't have in our life before the revolution. Before we had no money, it was expensive to buy clothes, to circulate from an area to another. Here we have access to everything like clothes, food, cigarettes, anything you need. We can go anywhere in the square freely." End of quote. So Abbas joined uh, the October uprising really from day one. Uh, the remarkable scale of millions of Iraqis rising up in largely peaceful protests across the country has been matched by remarkably violent repression that you, you also mentioned, Keiko. Uh, government and paramilitary groups, uh, militias using live ammunition, machine guns, stun grenades, anti-riot tanks and military-grade tear, uh, tear gas. Many protesters have been threatened, intimidated, arrested, beaten up, kidnapped, and even assassinated uh, by security forces and the militias associated with the Iraqi political establishment. So during the uprising, Abbas carried the bodies of his friends who were shot, um, some killed in gruesome deaths at tear gas canister, perforating their heads and flesh Others severely injured. He talks about the uprising as a revolutionary battle for which he's willing to endure his whole body, give up his own life, carrying the Iraqi flag as his only weapon. And he says something very, very important, and I'm going to quote him again. Uh, he says, even our bodies became used to it. Our body structures change in the protest. They can now handle tear gas and smoke. We can now breathe in the smoke. It became something normal our bodies could deal with and carry on standing and progressing towards the upper floors of the building, end of quote. So this is something he says when he described the day uh, him and other protesters took control of a very tall abandoned building commonly called the Turkish uh, restaurant, uh, El Matam uh, Turki, facing ba uh, Baghdad Tahrir Square and also facing the green zone which is really the prominent site of the Iraqi uprising. Uh, and uh, so the protesters actually renamed this building uh, uh, Jabal Uhud, the Uhud mount uh, mountain in reference to the prophetic battle. And they really turned it into their rear base. Um, so Abbas actually did survive the path of death once again. 
because he spent actually his 24th birthday in a hospital after receiving a, bu a bullet in his neck during a peaceful pro protest. Uh, that was in, 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 in January, at the end of January. Uh, and he joined really um, the macabre list. I mean, uh, 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 so far we know that there is way more, but the official numbers mention 750 uh, uh, individual you know, uh, killed during, since the uprising, mostly very young and mostly male Iraqis. Uh, and he basically joined the, the, the long list of the 25,000 unarmed protesters who have been injured. Uh, over half of them left wounded for life. So I would like to uh, now make a few points, a few theoretical points. Um, so first of all, I would like to argue that the Iraqi uprising, instead of being the expression of clear ideological frame of demands, um, constitute really something that is that I define as a rise against necropolitics and herbicide. Um, the Iraqi uprising really is often described by scholars as a rise against the Muhassasa system, against corruption, against nepotism and political violence. And I think it is the case. However, I think that is, is, it's, it's more actually relevant uh, to the Iraqi, Iraqi context to use uh, uh, the notion of necropolitics that has been theorized, uh, theorized by Ashil Membe. So for Ashil Membe, the concentration of activities connected with the extraction of valuable resources around uh, enclaves, uh, uh, so have really uh, created uh, um, privileged spaces of war and death and really provoking the emergence of new forms of governmentality that are technologies of destruction rather than disciplinary apparatus. So rather than biopolitics, he preferred talk, talking about the, the, the power to kill than the power to manage lives, right? Um, even more when insecurities generalize and the distinction between who bears weapons is, is blurred. Um, I think that Al Basra, for example, is, is, is really a, a, an excellent, actually, example of governmentality in which biopolitics and disciplining apparatus are really overcome by various forms of micro power. So while um, in Basra we have a strong network of mafia life uh, like armed groups and militias related to the political elite that compete for power and impose their rule through lethal violence really the collapse uh, of vital infrastructures such as water and electricity coupled with the toxicity of oil extraction uh, pollution render really the everyday life of uh, the inhabitant of El Basra almost uh, almost bearable so Basra is also a province experiencing a pandemic of cancer, especially children cancers that many associate to all extraction pollution coupled with war related chemicals and remains that the scholar Omar Adiwachi describes as the toxicity of everyday survival. So I think also when we talk about herbicide as defined by Stefan Graham, uh, I think Basra is also a good example. And uh, this toxicity and really the unbearable conditions of an everyday life lacking ba basic infrastructures can also be analyzed uh, as you know, really herbicide, as really killing the cities, right? Killing cities, so when we think of Baghdad, killing cities through militarization and killing Al Hayat al Madaniya, urban life, through also um, uh, privatization as well. Um, so I guess some of the protesters have also chosen to live in death. Uh, you know, they have chosen to fight against the system and they even chose death instead of living in this death world. And, uh, and I think that really, um, 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 I think it is really connected to what Abbas was describing about living between life and death and, and, and talking about uh, his body really changing during the protest. You know, I think that the uprising gave birth to a new political body, right? The second point uh, that I want to make, the second kind of theoretical conceptual point that I want to make is um, that instead of analyzing the uprising and the different waves that led, led to it as episodes of contention, and this is kind of a vocabulary that have been used to describe the uprising in Egypt and you know, in, uh, during uh, the Arab uh, Spring. Well, what I propose to do is actually to rely on Henri Lefebvre notion of 
la production de l'espace en français, la production de l'espace, et vraiment uh, approche ça comme un processus discursif, uh, matériel et imaginaire de l'espace de production. Donc, par la production de l'espace de production, je veux dire vraiment la notion de l'Elmedanie, Uh, uh, the discourse, the repertoire of action that really provide uh, um, a wide range of societal values from inclusion, uh, inclusive sense of belonging, the re refusal of a fear of sectarianism, of corruption, of violence. And also I include, because I really think it is a societal uh, uprising, even more than it, it is a, a political uprising, it also includes uh, the challenging of very conservative religious and gender norms. Um, I think that the, also, the uprising also created material space. And I think that when Abbas described the fact that, you know, in, in Tahrir Square, people access to food, to free food, to, uh, to clothes, to everything, basically, I think that really the spaces uh, and the new state forms uh, uh, really uh, provided or, or developed in Tahrir Square are, are examples of, of these material spaces uh, created by the uprising. And the third level, which is really the imaginary space, that is created by the uprising. I use the term imaginary as uh, Gilbert Durand when he talks about uh, uh, really archetypal, uh, archetypal symbols and representation that really shape a society's understanding of the world, really the cosmology of a society. And, and I think it's pretty clear in Abbas' words and it's pretty clear when, for example, we hear Uh, um, notions of uh, describing protest protesters as uh, Ibn Thenwe, which is uh, the name of one of the very, very famous Martai uh, uh, that died uh, uh, um, in the first weeks of the protest that used to be called Ibn Thenwe, that also referred to his mother. So it's a whole different alternative type of imaginary that is, is being developed in Tahrir Square that is also connected to uh, uh, broader imaginary, such as you know the, the, the broader religious uh, imaginary imaginary of, of Al Hussein. Uh, so um, I guess I guess I will I will uh, I will perhaps stop here for the, for the English because I'm also looking at the time. There were different points or, or details that I wanted to mention, but I think I'm going to skip to the translation now. Um, So, بدلا من تناول بحث الميداني في بغداد والنجف وكربلاء والناصرية والبصرة. انه بديت اشتغل عن حركه الاحتجاج من 2015 اريد اركز على تجربه شاب اسم عباس تعرفت عليه في ساحه التحرير في بغداد ديسمبر الفات واحاول من خلال هاي هذه التجربه اقترح بعض المفاهيم النظريه حول الانتفاضه فاولا عباس يصف الحياه في العراق عباره عن المشي في طريق الحياة والموت في نفس الوقت فيصف الحياة في العراق كأنه الحياة والموت مرتبطة وعباس ولد في عائلة فقيرة في قرية فقيرة في محافظة واسط وسافر إلى بغداد وهو طفل كان عمره 13 سنة أوه. Um, واشتغل أشغال, uh, أشغال الأجور اليومي كحمال في سوق الشورجة مثلا uh, وكان من هؤلاء الأطفال uh, هو كان يعيش ويشتغل uh, وينتقل في, وص, في وسط يعني الحرب الطائفية في العاصمة من منطقة إلى منطقة وبعد كم سنة اشتغل في شركة سياحية خاصة وسافر إلى تركيا وعاش هناك كم سنة وهو يصف هذه التجربة كتجربة أثرت على شخصيته ونفسيته وجعلته إنسان مختلف شاف الحياة الحضرية أو المدنية البعيدة عن الحرب والنزاع وشاف الخدمات والبنية التحتية ومؤسسات الدولة وشعر أنه هو كان محروم من هذه الحياة طول عمره بعدين رجع للعراق في بغداد بالذات وهو عمره يعني في بداية عمره 21 22 وظل يشتغل مع شركات خاصة في بغداد وبدأ يشارك بنشاطات ثقافية وتعرف على منظمات وأشخاص من المجتمع المدني وأصبح شخصية مهمة من الشخصيات المجتمع المدني وتأثر وشارك في مظاهرات 2015 
وعباس شارك بانتفاضة تشرين من أول يوم وكان من ضمن الشباب اللي احتلوا المطعم التركي وجبل أحد وواجه الموت وشاهد اغتيال أصدقاء في ساحة التحرير ولما يصف هذه التجربة يقول حتى طبيعة أجسامنا تغيرت في التحرير بحيث أنه قبل نقدر نتحمل الغاز المسيل للدموع والقمع الهائل اللي تعرضنا عليه من قبل الدولة والميليشيات وظل يعيش بالتحرير لحد ما هو انضرب طلقة في رقبته أثناء مظاهرة ونجا نجا من طريق الموت مثل ما هو يصفه لكن اضطر يترك التحرير في كانون الثاني فمن خلال تجربة عباس بكل تفاصيلها طبعا ما دخلت بالتفاصيل هواية خاصة بالعربي لأنه هذا ملخص بس أحاول أن أحلل الانتفاضة وأركز على بعض المفاهيم أولا الدقطة الأولى أولا الكثير يصف أو يحلل حركة الاحتجاج كحركة ضد الفساد والمحاصصة وكنشاط مدني يطالب يطالب عن الدولة ومؤسسات الدولة والخدمات ويدافع عن المدنية وهذا صحيح طبعا بس أريد الآن أقترح أنه الانتفاضة هي تثور ضد طريق الحياة والموت اللي وصفها عباس أي النيكروبوليتكس أو النيكرو باور كما يعرفه أشيل منبي وهذا المفهوم أيضا يعني أيضا الانتفاضة ثورة ضد الأربسايد كما يعرفه ستيفن جراهام يعني قتل الحياة المدنية والحضرية من خلال العسكرة أو الحضرية العسكرية الميليتاري أربانيزم والخصخصة وتدمير الدولة ومؤسساتها هاي النقطة خلينا نقول الأولى النقطة الثانية بدلا من تحليل الانتفاضة وكل ما انتجتها في 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 صيغه السياسه الخلافيه الكونتنشس بوليتيك اللي عاده يستخدموها علماء الاجتماع لوصف مثلا الانتفاضه في مصر فبدلا من هذا من هذا الاطار المعرفي النظري اريد او بدلا من اضع الانتفاضه في صيغه في صيغه ايديولوجيه معينه أريد أقترح أو أحلل الانتفاضة كناتجة فضاء مثل ما يعرف The Production of Space السوسيولوجيس الفرنسي أنغي لفيف أولاً إنتاج فضاء خطابي discursive مفهوم المدنية القيم الاجتماعية والمجتمعية لأن أعتبر أنه هاي الانتفاضة مجتمعية أكثر مما انتفاضة سياسية يعني هاي القيم المجتمعية البديلة ومن ضمنها طبعا تناول قضايا الدين والجندر بدل يعني بديلة من الثقافة المهيمنة الكولتشرال هجمني الصعيد الثاني هو الفضاء المادي like material space إنتاج الدولة البديلة في ساحة التحرير الخدمات الصحية والثقافية إلى آخره والصعيد الثالث هو الفضاء الخيالي the imaginary space بمعنى بيرنار دوران لما يتكلم عن الخيال الكوني والوجودي الذي يتناول مسائل الخير والشر ويضمن مفهوم الشهادة مثل من خلال عبارة ابن ثنوة واستخدام الخيال الحسيني لتعريف الانتفاضة كثورة ضد الظلم مثل ما كانت ثورة الحسين فهذا الملخص بالعربي ما ردت يعني أطيل ما قدرت أدخل بالتفاصيل أكثر بس بس ردت يعني أقترح بعض بعض الأفكار So thank you so much. <laughs> thank you very much, Zahlawa. Thank you very much for giving us a very, very moving story from Abbas. And uh, uh, well, actually, the, what you uh, pointed out uh, about uh, uh, kind of the emergence of the civil society uh, is a very important point. And uh, well, maybe we can discuss later uh, with other panelists. And uh, uh, I wonder the, how, how, how the protesters can maintain such kind of the autonomous public space. Uh, so so this is uh, uh, this is closely related to the future of this process movement. 